Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, why is it so hard to talk about feelings with the people we love? And I'm in conversation with Jen Dunning and Mark Baker. So, hi, um, my name's um, Mark and um, I co-authored a book with um, Jennifer about offering emotional uh, support. Um, We've both got a background of volunteering for a, an emotional support charity uh, called uh, Samaritans. Um, and we have a sort of very broad background. I've um, looked into mindfulness quite a lot and um, sort of traveled the world and I have, an experience, have a past career as a, um, as a nursery nurse. So I had a class of three-year-olds. So I've got quite a broad range that I bring to offering emotional support and looking at how we do that with um, people we know in comparison to people we don't know so uh, yeah and Jen yeah so I'm Jen Dunning um, my background is education so um, I worked in a I was a teacher secondary school for quite a number of years where I was a special educational needs coordinator um, with particular interest I suppose in the, the mental health side of things um, and I then retrained to become a specialist uh, assessor teacher so I do that and I also work with children in care, overseeing intervention side of things. And our question today is, why is it so hard to talk about feelings with the people we love? Um, did you want to kick us off, Jen, and, and share a few kind of opening thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I suppose the idea is that often when we're trying to talk to people um, and particularly our family and who it is that we want to talk to or ask for advice we find it particularly difficult I think to give an unbiased view an unbiased opinion um, I certainly see it from my point of view as a parent but also in my time as being a teacher that when when people want to talk to you about certain things they're already coming up to you with a particular angle a particular reserve of how you're going to you're going to accept what they're saying. Sometimes you can just know people too well and, and you have sort of roles where like, like the vouchers book came from Jennifer having a uh, um, discussion with her, her child about internet safety and then it led on to a whole lot of different situations that realised that the child found it very difficult to open up about, um, about a difficult situation she was in. And that, that to me was because sometimes you're just too close and you know people too well and you have like specific outcomes that, that you think might happen. Now, when you um, have that, don't have that proximity, that closeness, um, it does enable you to be able to offer a support that sort of looks more holistically. You can be further away, you can see the, you can see the woods for the trees, to use a, a, an analogy. So um, I think that would be why mainly we feel that, that the offering emotional support is very different and it's much harder when you're, when you're closer to someone. An example I can give, I can be quite open about this, my dad passed away recently and offering emotional support um, in my role as a Samaritan is completely different to offering emotional support to my mum and my brother and my family because I'm engrossed in that as well. I'm grieving, I'm having all these emotions and we know what other people are going through. So it does make it just that little bit more difficult. And you also fall into habits within families and roles as well. And it's by trying to break down those roles when you're supporting those that are, are um, loving and close to you. So a little bit like Jennifer had that role with um, her daughter. And I think Jennifer can explain that story better than I, I explained it. Are you happy to talk about that, Jennifer? Yeah, yeah. So um, it was this, well, it was probably about three weeks into the lockdown. So um, the school had sent some brilliant videos over to us about internet safety. And I'd gone through the lessons that they'd sent over um, to her. And then as part of the routine, I just spent sort of 10, 15 minutes with each of my children every evening, just for that little bit of downtime, a bit of hugging, seeing what they want to talk about. And um, and this particular time, she was just really sort of quite 
nervous. Um, not her usual self. She'd been absolutely fine for the previous weeks. This was all coming out of the blue, really. And uh, she says, Mum, I've got something to tell you. And, you know, all sorts of things flash through your mind because I was looking at her face thinking, OK, what's going on? You know, and the real sort of fear coming into me thinking, oh, no, what's happened? And she says, um, I've done something I shouldn't have done. And of course, this is sort of building up panic in me even more now. And then she said, I, I went on an internet website that I wasn't supposed to have gone on. So I was like, right, OK, can you tell me about it? What was it about? Anyway, uncovering it all, it was very, it was just a case of she went on a website that was completely harmless, but she hadn't got permission to go onto this website. She just clicked on a link. And I said, um, why didn't you tell me about this? You know, when did this happen? She says, well, it happened a week ago. And I was like, but why didn't you tell me? What, what is it this, over this week that you've not told me? She goes, I thought you'd be angry. So it was her judgment of me thinking that would be my initial reaction because it was a rule that you don't come things you shouldn't do, which stopped her for the whole week. So for that whole week, she'd hidden it to the point where I didn't even know that she'd done it. Her behavior was absolutely normal. Every evening when we'd have that particular time with each other, she just, nothing raised and all of a sudden one week after she felt that she had the confidence to be able to tell me um and when I spoke to Mark about this I just thought I wonder you know this was so innocent but how many other times do we have this situation where we have got something we want to tell somebody but we just don't know how to start or we think that other person would be angry and of course we see it in um in the volunteering that we have is we say, well, do you have people you can talk to? Well, I have family, I have friends, but I can't talk to them. You know, it's a very common line that we often hear because they don't want to upset their friends or the family or they'll just try to solve things for them. And so again, when Mark and I were talking about it, it was a case of why is it that everybody's always trying to solve problems? Why can't we just stop and listen? And that's where our conversations start to get more and more of like, okay, so what role are we playing? who is the parent who is the adult who is the child why are we always judgment and is this that a 10 year old already has an opinion that stops her from saying something which is quite innocent compared to other children teenagers adults where they're desperate to tell people things but they don't know who to say it they don't know how to start it they don't know what that person's reaction is going to be and that can be terrifying and then of course you lock that back up close the lid and then either the anxiety builds up or it's something that will, like a jack-in-the-box, it will come out at some point. So um, we were uh, trying to come up with ideas. Well, what could we do? What could we come up with which would just allow that opportunity where it's managed, it's, it's supported in a non-judgment way so that even an adult for their child could pick it up or a teacher or a staff member or a youth member, anybody could have this tool that they could just pick it up and work with it and that child knows that they'll be listened to um, and that, that's where it came from really. So tell us about the book maybe Mark if you would outline a little bit about the the book and how it works and yeah I, and I, I think it pretty much follows on from um, what, what Jennifer says it, 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 it's a quite a good way of breaking habits and cycles um, uh, we always fall into uh, habits with um, our family. Like, I'll, I'll give you a quick example, and then I'll tell you about the book. Like when I was at university, one of my um, one of my housemates, his, his dad came to visit, and when they left, they did a really big hug and said, "See you later, son," and off they went. And, and um, when when um, when uh, he left, I was like, "Oh, I I don't think that happens with with me." I was like, "Our family, we don't hug." I I wonder why that is. And he said, "Well, it's always going to be like that until you change it." So the next time I came, I hugged. It was a little bit awkward. My parents always shown love, but we just didn't do it in that way. But then it started to become normal. And, and this is what the vouchers book does, is it, it enables another way of changing a habit, of breaking a habit and of doing something different. So what, what the vouchers book is, it's a book full of um, about 12 vouchers. And each, what, what you can do is you can give it to somebody who you feel might be in need of emotional support. 
and um, th th they can then um, cut the voucher out of the book and if they want to fold it up and they could write your name on the back and who it's from if they want to and they can give it to you in person or they can hide it somewhere and then if you find the voucher um, when you find the voucher you know what the child's or the person who uses it what their emotional needs are and what's required of you exactly to do so it's a little bit like I want this to change a hug. So I gave my dad a hug and gave my mum a hug. And, and that's like 15 years ago and it's just normal now because that, that cycle changed. And that's sort of what vouchers does. Um, it, it enables you to ask for something that may be a little bit difficult to ask for or a little bit different from, from the usual. Because like we said at the beginning, one of the most difficult things about um, ask, asking um, family and supporting family is the habits and the roles that you've always felt fell into like I, I'm the child and you're the adult and I think you had a, had a um, podcast on this before but like the um, transactional analysis parent adult child you have those those roles and 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 it sort of enables it enables a a, a changing of roles to by have given those vouchers it can put the children in control it empowers them and that was that was the idea so jennifer wrote wrote the vouchers um up and um we came up with the idea of calling it that ouchers and focusing on that ouch in the middle of vouchers and and pulling that out so that the the uh vouchers are helping with that emotional ouch and are people using it jen yeah yeah um they tend to be um, sort of more anecdotal responses that people have because they're always very personal, the feedback that uh, we've been getting. Um, so a um, couple of examples, um, one person got it and then she privately messaged me later on to say, thank you so much, my 15 year old, we've been trying to get her into counselling, we've been trying to get her as much help as possible and nothing's worked she's just she just clams up she just can't talk she's not in the place but we know she needs help um and then she says I gave her the book and I handed it to her and she says and my daughter just flicked it and just burst into tears and gave her a huge hug because it wasn't the fact that she even started using the vouchers it's the fact that she was gifted something to say when you're ready I can be that person to listen to that was one really beautiful story that we thought, wow, you know, that's just so heartwarming. Um, and I had a, another one only the other week. Um, the family had bought the vouchers based on um, school um, recommendations. And um, they'd got it at home. And for a couple of weeks, it just stayed there, wasn't touched, wasn't used. And I thought, oh, all right then. Well, well we've tried, never mind. Um, and then the first day back after lockdown, started going back to school, first half day back at school, child comes home, goes up to their room. And uh, within, I suppose within, within the hour, comes back down with a voucher, asking for a hug. And the parent was just over the moon because they'd never had their child who'd got special educational needs, never had that, their child come ask for a hug to begin with, but to actually, reach out and ask for something was a massive step for that family knowing that okay a hug might not identify the emotion but it means that they want something from them and they could just give that hug so again they're just you know they're just lovely little anecdotal um moments that we're getting that they won't put on amazon when they buy it because they're so personal and that's what we wanted we wanted people to have that personal um experiences with it and each voucher would bring something very different for them it might work it might not um yeah so we're getting some really beautiful stories coming through now and why do you think it's easier for people to bridge that gap and begin to start those kind of interactions using uh the vouchers than it would be to just ask what is it that you think that they're doing that that it yeah that, that offers that support um, I would say, because th this is often what Mark and I say to people, the first step of the vouchers is actually gifting the book. By gifting the book, you are saying to that person, I am here for you, whether you want to use vouchers or not, I am here for you in a, a non-verbal, communicative way. Mm. 
Then there's some beautiful quotes and uh, little details in the book as well, just to remind ourselves of why listening is important and patience and giving time. Um, and then just, it, it's that conversation starter. The vouchers aren't saying, I want to talk to you. They're asking for something very specific, very small, and it predominantly focuses around time. Just wanting that little bit of time or a little bit of contact, or um, I think one of the vouchers is, um, I know I've done something wrong, please just listen to me. Because often if somebody's done something wrong, they want to tell somebody, but they don't want to be then having the earache of being told off when they've already gone through it in their head or they've already been told off elsewhere. So it's just a case, of, I just want to tell you, just listen. And I think there's there's something there, isn't there, about knowing that someone's going to be in the right frame of mind, sort of ready to listen, because um, it kind of struck me, you said in the conversation that you had with your daughter that kind of prompted this whole exploration for you, that was part of a regular routine of listening that you, you had. Um, and that although it sounds like you maybe beat yourself up a little bit that that conversation couldn't happen sooner, but I can imagine in lots of families that conversation would never have happened because it was only because your daughter knew presumably that uh, you were ready to listen at those times in the evening that she perhaps built up the courage to to start that conversation. Yeah. And do you, I, I I'm interested as well about how obviously you both. Um, uh, work with the Samaritans and uh, volunteer there and I think it's interesting that sometimes people do feel able to um, pick up the phone or actually increasingly I find people want to use kind of the digital technologies to, um, to to link up with someone who is completely anonymous and I find myself often advising um, schools and people who work with children that if children aren't yet ready to have a face-to-face -face conversation um, that they might feel more able to approach someone like Childline or Samaritans um, and it's sometimes hard to put my finger on exactly why it's just something one of those things that we know works and so we recommend it but I wondered if either of you had any thoughts on that maybe Mark if you had any, any yeah thoughts. I, I think it's because it's a safe place to talk in, in, like Jennifer touched on earlier is that um, people say I don't want to worry my family I don't want to worry and, and put panic on on somebody else and it's something I can quite relate to like you, you don't want to pass that burden on whereas the person you're speaking to has um does, hasn't doesn't have a specific outcome like perhaps if you told your parent or a brother that you were having a really difficult time they might they they might want to try and fix it for you whereas it's Samaritans we just try to help people mo make the most informed decision they can. We help them explore their options and discuss and find out how they're coping. And, and it's very much about the person and solely on what they're going through and what they're experiencing. And, and it's very difficult to do that when you're in a family setting, because like I, I said earlier about my dad passing, you've got those all these other dynamics that are going on. Whereas the dynamic that you have, I guess, within Childline and um, Samaritans is that the person you're speaking to at Samaritans or Childline, their complete focus is on your emotions and what you're going through and your experiences. And um, I think it's, I think the most, the most, I can only talk from the Samaritans perspective, but the main idea is a little bit like the book. It's about empowering, empowering people to find the option that's best for them and exploring and making sure that whatever they decide to do it's the most informed decision they can make. And, and, and we, we do that just by supporting and being a listening ear. And it's Samaritans, people know that, that we're, we're, uh, we're pretty, everything's confidential to Samaritans as long as we, as long as we don't know where you are. Um, we, we want, and we want to keep everyone safe, but, but people know it's a safe place to talk and open up without, without any judgment as well. And, and, it, and as much as we would try not to judge are those closest to us it's, it's very very it's very difficult and um and at, at Samaritans I'd also say we don't know enough to judge we might only speak with somebody for half an hour and say they're 40 but it's 39 years 364 days and 23 and a half hours that we don't know about their life we don't know enough to judge and and to try and find outcomes and solutions 
However, with our families and those closest to us, they know they know much more. They know almost all of your life. So we'll try and find those answers and give you the solutions. And um, one final thing, the most the thing that we find um, in by empowering people to find their own answers, they're much more likely to, to, to action those findings, those um, options, than if you tell someone what to do or sort of persuade someone to do, because your persuasion can wear off. Whereas if the person finds their own options and finds their own solutions, it's much more likely to be carried through to a resolution. And I think that's perhaps why the organisations like Ch um, Childline and Samaritans are quite quite powerful in, in the service they offer. I think it's always one of the um, hallmarks of really skilled um, practitioners uh, is that ability to to listen and empower and enable rather than to just advise. Um, I think that we often feel like we want to fix things, don't we? And actually being able to step back and actually enable someone to find their own way forwards. Um, I, I find sometimes that the conversations where the other person goes away feeling that I've done the most for them is when I feel I've done the least, when you've kind of acted literally as a sounding board and uh, asked the occasional prompt. I wonder what we can all learn to enable those conversations then because it, it feels like maybe obviously you've created a tool here for saying I need this conversation but then there's the next bit isn't there which is having that that conversation well and I wonder if either of you had thoughts on perhaps some of the the skills perhaps that you've picked up um in your role as sort of supportive listeners um that might bode well for for families or or those working with children as well I don't know which of you want to go first on that one um, well, with, when um, the book came out, quite a number of them, um, as friends often do, they sort of buy the book out of support. Um, but in my particular situation, because quite a number of friends who are educational based um, bought it, they said, you know, this is a great idea, but why can't we have something for school? Why can't we use something that would be really practical in school? But we can't have a voucher that says I need a hug. We need to have something more specific. So um, we went back to the drawing board and we worked with um, some fantastic practitioners in a number of schools to come up with what would be appropriate um, so that we can expand sort of how many people we could try and help as much as possible. So we, we've called it the schools edition, but actually it can be the youth work edition. It can be an, anybody's edition really um, but it, it just widens the type of methods of nonverbal communication that you can reach out for um, and just give people those extra ideas. And we're not precious about what we've created. So everybody who buys it, they get a unique code and then they can go on the website and download as many vouchers as, as they need and as they want, because our aim is just to try and start that conversation as many people as they want. And as Mark and yourself said, it, it's about to the extent that you want to talk that voucher allows you to say as much as you want or as little as you want it's the empowerment as much as possible so that that child remains in control the whole time um, and I suppose it's going back to that transactional analysis again as adults or as carers we often put ourselves in the um, parent role and we just it, it's trying to be a tool to bring um, whoever the listener is, into the adult role, the impartial, the listening, the non-advice, the exploring of what their options are. So the person given the voucher, the child, even if it's an adult, their role means that they are being listened to impartially. Mm. I, I think I think the, the, the added skill is, is, like you said, is, is about demonstrating that you're listening, really demonstrating repeating the person's words back keep giving them the time and space to say what they want want to say and allowing them to feel their feelings and that's the that's the main skills that this that um this book hopefully offers um we've got a website that supports it and that um that that shares some some of the listening skills that you can um use and and it's it's very important that when you're supporting people it's it's very much about them and what they're going through and their issues that I think that's a really important skill it's very easy to it, it, and 
it's, it's very easy when you're supporting family to go, yeah, do you remember when I went through something similar like that when I was in my 20s? Yeah, see, I got through it. That, that's, that's nice, and you're trying to, trying to help, but that isn't helping the person ex explore their feelings and what they're going through and their emotions. And, and as hard as it is, it is the right thing to do when you're supporting someone, even if I'm, is to keep it very much focused on their emotions, their feelings, their experiences. And there's a really nice saying that I read, I can't remember where it is, a feeling's got one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to be felt. And once it's been felt, it's, it's done. You have to give, give that feeling the space to, to feel and be felt. And that's what that does by giving, let, keeping it focused on them and allowing them to share and share their experiences and feel their feelings. And that's one of the major tips that I think this book enables and allows to happen. One, and if you can use that skill of reflecting, using the person's words back with them to give them the space to feel, I think it's, that's one of the main skills. Do you think we've got worse at kind of listening and creating that sort of safe space for, for feeling? Or do you think we've become more aware of the need to do it? I think I'd say people are very aware of what they need to do. And I think certainly over the last year, a lot of emphasis is being made to schools to develop these relationships. And they're given all these theory names. Um, oh, let's have this training on this. But actually, it's far too complicated. When you're in the chalk phase, we just need something very simple. And it is just about relationships, just stopping, being there, being present in the moment at that time for that person. So I think we're aware, but, but I feel that there's too many complicated names that are just attached to everything. Um, certainly when Mark and I were going through this book and then when we created the school version and we were, we were saying, right, well, these are the aims and this is linked. To, we were amazing ourselves, but, oh, that links to that and that links to that. That wasn't our intention at all when we wrote it. We just wanted something so simple, so basic that people could just pick it up and anybody could run with it. A child could understand it and they could pass it to another child. And so just by doing that, you're developing those skills without a training course. You're just being there for that other person, which is, you know, it's just a gift. Yeah. And do you think we get better at that with practice? Ooh. Yeah, I guess it's how, how often you practice it. Um, I would definitely say the longer you volunteer with the Samaritans, the more skillful you get at, at it. So, so it, is, it is practice. Uh, um, skillful at supporting people through any situation. Um, I guess it's quite hard to say really because I don't know how often people have to use it in their everyday lives, at, at, like in, in schools and I'd imagine in, in work settings and volunteering settings. I think you use it a lot um, and, and it would be a great skill like the home edition would be great to use all the time and it would be a great way of refining those great tool to refine those skills. Um, are people getting better at it? If I had to say, I would say yes. I think people are much more emotionally aware. Um, I, I've got a nephew who I think is very emotionally aware from, from school and, um, and life. And, and I think from when I went to school in comparison to, to his schooling and he, the way he is, I think he's very emotion, much more emotionally aware and, and I think that's because of the, the settings that it's, it's schools are like, is, is my guess. I haven't really been in a school much recently, but by, by what I see of children their age, they do seem much more emotionally aware. What do you think, Jen? This is your, your kind of bag. Do you think that we are, yeah, how, how do you think we're, we're doing here? Do you think there's a lot of work to do? Are we, are we doing better than we were? Um, I think it goes into fits and starts, really. Um, I think we can have um, a, a promotion of where, so this whole, at the moment, this whole business of is catch up about the academic side of things or is catch up about the emotional side of things because we have not had those um, social interactions with people. Um, and then all of a sudden the emphasis will stop for everybody and then a new fad will start. 
So I think it comes round in, in, yeah, fits and starts really. Years ago, my, my absolute um, favourite um, course to teach was the personal social and mental health education, that side of things. And the impact that, that just those hours for those children at that particular time was massive. Then of course, it wasn't made statutory because the emphasis was more on the numeracy and the literacy side of things. And now it's coming back again. Oh, we need to have these sessions. We need to have these words. And like with Mark saying about his nephew, the words are being bandied about, but are they words or are they actions? And is it going to really be used for the next 15, 20 years? Or is it just until we feel that everything's okay again, and then we can turn our focus onto something else? And then if, if we don't keep practicing, if we don't keep trying, we can lose those skills. We can lose how to listen because we haven't got time. We've got the next thing that we need to do. I haven't got time to listen and to listen to what your options and what your story is at the moment. I've got to go off and I've got to go and fix something else now because that's the pressure that I've got in my life at the moment. So I think it's great that hopefully we can all sort of slow down a little bit and have that emotional stability and that, that chance to have those conversations but again if, if it's not encouraged if it's not upheld I think we could be at a loss of, of losing it again yeah that's a challenge isn't it and I think the other thing that I wonder about is um how it can be quite difficult to create that space uh, both within busy times but also when we can't see a clear outcome so you know one of the things that you've both talked about is the need to create those kind of emotional safe spaces and to be present when a child or an adult indeed might be distressed but you wouldn't be necessarily telling them what to do and there might not be a clear outcome from that conversation or from that moment that you have with them um, and that that can be a bit challenging can't it in a in a busy context because how do we know if what we're doing is is having an impact and what would you advise there do either of you have any thoughts on that hmm. it's, it's quite interesting because I've been reading a little bit about about not focusing on the outcome but just doing the best you can in each each and every moment for example not focusing on winning the game of tennis focus on playing the best point you can over and over again and the result and the outcome takes care of itself a bit like building a wall focus on the best brick that you can and lay the best brick you can over and over again and I think if we just focus on the basics really well over and over and over again the outcomes will take care of themselves and, and those basics are like I said listening keeping it focused on the other person and um giving the person space to enable them to feel those feelings. And if we can just do the basics and not overcomplicate it, like Jen said, we the outcomes will just take care of, of themselves. And, and, and the more I listen to that, the more that makes makes sense. We get we get a little bit outcome driven and then we start focusing on on our desires and really wanting this more. But if we just do the the, the basics well, we might get an even better outcome than what we were ever thinking. And if you try and think, overthink and try and over engineer, I don't think you necessarily always get what you want. But if you do the best you can in each moment, that takes care of itself. So that's my theory on it. I don't know if that's what you think as well, Jen. Yeah, I think if you can deal with things there at the moment, at the time, you're then not having to um, deal with the the closing of the box and the emotions then for closing and hiding those feelings and and the experiences um so when um when i was having a conversation with some colleagues of mine we were saying about how a number of services are are just at crisis point themselves we we're saying how many services are just looking at the brown leaves of a tree and they're so keen to remove the brown leaves of the tree and say oh look there's a green leaf over there let's look at that one Take, peel off the brown leaf and then you've just got the green leaves rather than thinking hang on a minute those brown leaves are actually connected to a branch that is slowly dying why is that branch withering what is happening and it doesn't come down to the trunk it actually comes down to the roots what is happening to the roots what is happening in the soil 
And I think all too often we're constantly looking for, as Mark was saying, the outcome. Let's try and fix the here and now rather than dealing with the, the real roots and the real issues. And if we can peel that back as much as possible to, to for families to support it as much as possible or at the chalk face in schools or settings where if something has happened, that, uh, in, that culture, the environment of that place is, we are here, we are going to listen, rather than saying, well, sorry, you're not extreme enough for us to listen at the moment. Come back when things are a little bit worse for you. Come back when your self-harming gets that little bit harder for you. Come back when you've had um, a couple of suicide attempts. That's not good enough. We need to hang on a minute. Let's go back to when you first had those thoughts. Let's go back to when that first started. And if we can get to that right to that beginning, and it could be something really small that's happened, or it could be something huge that's happened in that person's life. Whatever it is, that's affected that soil, that's affected that root, and that's infected that tree. So if we can get into a society where we're working at the basics, and even if we've got um, parents or carers who can't listen or can't hear us right at this moment, maybe we know somebody else who's got those skills and who has got that time at that particular moment to be able to listen so that we're not having to put the lid on our emotions and hide it it's going to be supported there and then and if we can get that into into our everyday life into our everyday practice eventually hopefully we'll have a you know a happier sort of neighborhood community society rather than waiting until we're at crisis point and then services can't support yeah Absolutely. there's there's plenty of examples on uh, of that about dealing with it now in in the in the moment there's a um there's a really nice philosophy um it's, it's a taoist philosophy that, that says that in the west we've got it around the wrong way we see as the future is in front of us and the past is behind us and we do that all all the time um and we, we see we're, we're always grasping for the next thing for the future and we want want to do that whereas whereas in the eastern philosophies they see the past as in front of you and the future is behind of you so behind you so you can look at what what's happened in the past and learn from that and you can choose to do the best thing you can in the now whether that's being kind to yourself or or getting support and giving a voucher or whatever and based on what you do now that depends on what future lines up behind you and, and and that that you, and so so we're not desiring and grasping and suffering because we're wanting this thing that we can see. We're just doing the best we can in the now. And and there's an and, and that the example of this I always think is is um, in the in the prisons where they treat people with compassion. The future that lines up behind the people is one of less crime and less repetition of of crime. If you treat people the same. Um, based on their past behaviour and in your, you're brutal to them in a the prison, they're more likely to commit another crime in the past. And your power is always in the now. And that's what that, that says. The, 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 if you treat the roots, the leaves will take care of themselves to go back to... Um, and, and keeping with that plant analogy, if a plant is unwell, we will change the environment. We'll put it near the sun. If it's not getting enough sun, we will move it and we we'll nurture it. We need to do that with us as well. And I wonder if either of you can um, talk just a little bit about how if we're to, to do that and kind of be more giving of ourselves and to listen and to care and to show that compassion, how we can do that in such a way that it doesn't end up detrimental to the giver of the listening and the compassion because I think we all know people in our lives who are great at that and we gravitate towards and certainly in our school settings Jen I'm sure you're probably one of those people that the kids come to with their with their issues um, and that's fantastic for the child to have someone they can rely on but it, it can become a, a burden for some people can't it and I guess you guys will have been trained in how you manage this because you do this supportive listening all the time for Samaritans but what advice would you give to parents, carers, teachers, teaching assistants who might be wanting to do more of this compassionate listening and care? I think it's almost, um, if you've received a voucher and you're struggling to cope 
with that emotional support. I mean, on the website, we've put some ideas and some signposting if you've received a voucher. But I think it's for anything. If somebody's gravitated to you because you're a listener and you're finding it hard, then you need to have those skills as well to then go on and seek that next person for that extra support. Um, as part of Samaritan, there, there is a massive network of support when you're on a duty, after the duty, as part of training. It's, it's this huge network of support that's constantly there for you. And I think in maybe in educational settings, we need to have more of the idea of supervision. We have supervision in so many different um, jobs, in so many different roles. And when we're dealing and trying to support with people, we need to have that listening ear. And I think it, it comes down to the idea that if we can start a little bit with one family and then that family gets used to listening and then they reach out to another family and that family starts being good at listening. And then that family thinks, hang on a minute, that works really well. I'll reach out to that next family. If we can just pass it all on little by little, it's not one you know, it's not a case of just attending a three hour training session going, right, there you go. You're all trained. You're you're informed. You're qualified to go. It's a case of, OK, so let's just try it little bit by little bit. Let's reach out to people until it becomes part of people's blood, part of their bones. And we slowly, I suppose, change the community very steadily so that everybody's loyal is absolutely fine. And if it's if it's not so good, then we've got the strength to support somebody else who is struggling. Does that make some sense? <laughs> yeah, it does make sense. Is there anything you'd add to that, Mark? Yeah, th- yeah. I think I think it's about being just being kinder in general. And there was a really interesting um, study done on um, Buddhist monks against um, so teenagers who are Buddhist monks and um, sort of high school students in um, America. And they found that the high school students in America were um, were much more caring towards their peers than the Buddhist monks were um, at around about 15, 16. And what, what, what they and when they asked the, the monks and the masters about that, they was like, well, yeah, but first of all, they need to know how to care for themselves. And once they can fully care for themselves, then they'll be in a better position to care for everyone and that's like that when they're 18 and when they finish this that they've got 30 they've got 60 years of their life left where they can then know how to care for everyone and um and i think that's the same with us as well if we if we can root the kindness and the the listening skills into the education system and just keep it simple the listening skills um, reflecting um, clarifying and trying to understand the other person but when 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 people leave school and then they're in adulthood we have a whole generation now that can support people and support each other and support everyone so about what, what that said that you know first of all just treat people to be kind to themselves and the rest will take care of its, um, itself. And um, yeah, yeah. So, so it goes back to education again, it being a real fundamental part of it. And it's not really, it, it, for, for me, it should be part of like the math, English and science. It's, it is that important to the well being of, of people's lives, the, the amount of money it will save in the long run for, throughout the health service and throughout all the other things that go on would be massive. Um, so, so it, yeah, that, that's the key for me is the education and making it normal, absolutely normal. And having the time to, that extra, to do that from a young age. Yeah, just that one, one extra minute or two extra minutes could be the world of difference for everybody around. So just having that time, even funding, addi- lots of additional funding won't help with schools unless staff, everybody in the school has that extra time. It's, it's one of the things I find myself reflecting on often with um, staff who want to better help the children in their care um, and saying, actually, it, it's not even about having lots and lots of time. It's about the quality of that time and a child knowing that maybe just for five minutes in that week, they had your absolutely undivided attention. and They were the most important thing in your world for a moment. Um, for some children, that's really like affirming and life changing if they don't get that from anyone else any other time. Yeah, good point. Yeah, it's a quality over quantity sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. 
Um, I always think that the end of an episode is a really important moment to leave any final thoughts with people. Um, what thoughts would you like people to, to, to go away with? This is a moment to bring up anything that you maybe didn't get a chance to say uh, thus far or something that you'd like to, to kind of repeat and uh, plant firmly in people's minds as they go about their day. Maybe we'll start with you, Mark. Oh, right. Yeah, I think it's just keep it simple. I think the, the lesson of it. There's, there's so many labels and and uh, things that, that get, get banded around and we don't really need to know the labels. It all comes down to just being kind, compassionate, grateful for what grateful and just listening. And, and when and when someone's in need of support, keep the focus on them. And if you need support, find the focus so that the focus can be on you afterwards and, and that links back to the Samaritans if we're supporting a difficult call we would our, all our focus would be on that caller everything everything about it but we know the moment after that call's finished um if it's a really difficult call and we need the emotional support that the emotional support will then be there for us so it's like when that person needs support support them with everything you've got listen keep it all on them and then find support for yourself after after that and then the world will gradually sort itself out but keep it simple great advice and how about you Jen what thought would you like to leave people with um yeah I I absolutely agree keep everything simple we don't need clever gimmicks we don't need clever terminology we just need to be here in the present um if we want to be physically healthy we need to be mentally healthy and to be mentally healthy yeah your soul needs to be healthy so really go back to the absolute basics and to be able to do that, you just need to have time.